welcome to Evo Car of the Year 2023. Every year, the Evo team gathers at some of our favourite roads with what we feel are the best performance cars to have been launched within the last 12 months. Now, this isn't a conventional group test, neither is there any circuit work or lap times. Instead, this is all about how the cars make us feel when we drive them and how successfully they nail their original design briefs in their specific niches. Remember, there are no bad cars here, but there is one exceptional car that will be crowned Evo Car of the Year. How? Well, we'll drive them morning, noon and night, and then we'll do it again and again and again, until finally, at the end of the week, my fellow six judges and I will award each of our nine contenders a score out of 100. We'll then do the maths and we'll have a winner. First, let's take a closer look at this year's contenders. The old 720S was one of our favourite supercars. In fact, our 2017 car of the year. In an increasingly electrified supercar market, the 750S is resolutely old school in being internal combustion only, but with more power and much of the sharp and dynamic prowess of the 765 LT. Could this be the best McLaren yet? By rights, this should be really intimidating. I'm sat on the wrong side of the car, got so much power behind us, but it's not, it's really usable. And part of the reason is because this car's talking to you all the time. There's so much feedback coming back to you through the pedals, through this beautiful hydraulic power steering, this incredible visibility around this all round canopy. It feels like you're sat in a fighter jet. And in fact, the performance <laughs> feels like a fighter jet as well. crossing over the border between Northern England and Scotland on roads we know well, our judges begin to get a feel for the cars and form initial impressions. And one car that should suit these roads very well is the 911 Carrera T. Essentially the lightest and most driver focused 911 in the regular range, the Carrera T once again combines the entry level engine with a manual gearbox, limited slip diff and sports suspension along with various lightening measures to create a 992 that should be a blast on the challenging roads of our test. Although the 992 generation of 911 does feel undoubtedly like a bigger car, you sit so low down in it that it feels really sporty. It would sort of be easy to underestimate the 911 Carrera T in this test because it is a little bit more muted despite its exterior colour than some of the other cars. But so much of what we love about Porsches is present and correct in this, so all the control weightings are wonderful. It's one of only two manuals in the test, and it is a good shift. The noise might not be the most well, bombastic here, but it's still really lovely, the way it crescendos with that flat six. And it feels special whenever you get into it. One of the criticisms we've had about the 992, and it certainly applies to this, is that it does feel like a big car, and you feel actually the weight on some of the bumpier roads right here. We love the Alpine A110. In many ways, it's the one modern car that epitomizes what Evoness is all about. The original was narrowly pipped to the Evo Car of the Year crown in 2018, and while the S was a slight disappointment, the new R promises so much, with a curb weight of just 1,086 kilograms and all its trick carbon fiber parts, including the wheels. It's expensive though, can it punch above its weight again this year? 
just feels so good. It gives you everything you want from a small, lightweight, compact, modestly powerful car. Um, I, I certainly spend a lot of my time in Evo writing about how things have got too big, too powerful, too heavy. And this car proves all of, all of those desires to have more modest, more exploitable cars. It just feels so good in the rain, in the dry, on bumpy roads, on fast, smooth roads. It just comes alive. And I think it proves the point that, that in this instance, less is very much more. Is a third Evo Car of the Year crown in just four years possible for the M department? While the M4 CSL was a major disappointment last year, the CS badge is something this new M3 shares with the winning M5 CS and M2 CS. What chance? Another Car of the Year title. The G80, when that was launched, many of us were a little bit worried that uh, the M department might have lost the plot. It was big, it was heavier, it was auto, in the UK, auto only. And uh, then there was the Starling, of course, which we won't go into that now. But you know what? G80 is a fantastic car. I ran one on the magazine for six months and I have to say it really got under my skin and I grew to love it. It had such a broad breadth of ability. But this car is a lot more special. Yes, it's expensive, 115,900 pounds. Yes, it's only got a little bit more power and despite having some lovely bits like the carbon bonnet, it's only about 15 kilos lighter, but that's not the point. What you're paying for and what you're getting and that makes it special is the tuning and the changes to the chassis because this car, in the way it steers, in the way it rides bumps, in its body control, and in its overall balance, is a big step on from the regular M3 competition. Maserati's resurgence has been led by the sublime MC20 supercar, last year's Evo Car of the Year. Can the Italian firm make it two in a row with this handsome V6 twin-turbo powered four-wheel drive coupe that offers surprisingly practical accommodation with the promise of real driver appeal? In this test, the Gran Turismo represents the traditional Gran Tura. It's unusual to have two GTs in Evo Car of the Year, but whereas the Aston Martin DB12 is, by their own admission, a Super GT, the Maserati is much more to the tried and tested recipe. Certainly, those that have done big journeys in it, including over the course of this week, agree it excels in that role. It really is a superbly comfortable device to travel in. It's searingly rapid too, its V6 having ebullient performance, if not the soundtrack of the engine in the MC20. But it starts to struggle when driven quickly on the roads unless the damping is wound right up to its firmest setting and it never fully masks its size and weight. But as a GT car, it's really rather remarkable, better than quite a few others in this segment. Um, it rides beautifully um, and then when you do sort of get it up on its toes and over some of the challenging roads we've been on, its body control and its damping, it really does allow you to get into it and, and enjoy yourself with it. Aston Martin is back with this Super GT, the DB12. With a hugely powerful twin-turbo V8, a much sportier chassis setup than the old DB11, and a thoroughly modernised interior, can the new car charm our judges' hearts? Well, it's, it's in some very strong company here this year, but if, if it was on looks, then I think this would be the winner. Slight concern that I had at the launch, which was in uh, the south of France, was that the ride might be a bit too tough. On the smooth roads, it was fantastic when you can use all the performance and uh, really stretch its legs um, on good, smooth, flowing roads. It is absolutely sensational. And up here, and the roads we found for this test, 
there are smooth bits like this and the car feels great but as soon as it gets a bit difficult the car is still showing those signs of being a bit too tough on the uh, on difficult roads so it's it's not really delivering that gt bit in contrast to the maserati the db12 is feral its v8 has a savage punch but overall it's almost too much toned down by 20 percent in terms of both outright power and suspension rates it would be a better car as is it can really struggle for traction on these roads and never really settles on even smoother surfaces. Put bluntly, we wanted the Aston to be more like the Maserati, to have better GT credentials alongside all its flair and performance, and we'd love the Gran Turismo to have just a little of the Aston's bite and driver appeal. <laughs> The Huracan has matured magnificently in recent years and will forever love its naturally aspirated V10. Can the Storato do the lineage justice amongst this tough competition? Normally supercars are all about being hunkered down to the road, minimal body roll, maximum grip, but this car's different. You feel the roll when you turn into a corner on the longer suspension and it's on all-terrain tyres. So they're not about outright grip on the road, they're about being able to take this car off-road and have adventures and play with it. I think uh, for me, it probably won't come as any surprise given my love of rallying that I was really intrigued to drive Lamborghini Huracan Storato um, because it looks like the sort of car that I'd love. But equally, you, you never know. It, it, is it going to be a gimmick? Is it going to be too much of a toy? Is it going to work sort of away from the, the sort of some rough and tumble roads you might expect it to work on? Um, so that's been absolutely fascinating to get behind the wheel of that. It feels so small as well. There's something about it that makes it feel almost like a, a hot hatch in a supercar. <laughs> From the ridiculous back to the sublime and to one of this year's most anticipated cars. It's the 992 based GT3 RS, potentially a new landmark in road going performance machinery. Or is it the point where Porsche's GT department goes too far chasing track and aero performance and builds a car with no real place on the public road? It's a spectacular machine and we can't wait to find out the answer. Clearly the extreme nature of the RS is the root of its appeal and what's excited us about the car, but that's also potentially its biggest weakness because we always go to our favourite but often most challenging roads. The time of year for a car of the year means that we get mixed weather at best. It's chucking it down today. So that was the question mark, I think, that hung over whether the RS was really going to do well or struggle. What we found so far is if you use all the tools at your disposal, particularly the suspension settings, then the car finds its feet in a way that you really can't get your head around the traction control and stability control, works brilliantly with the car. The only thing it struggles with is standing water, but a number of the other cars in the test do the same. There's so much to love about this car anyway, the engine and transmission is a, is a highlight, but the, the way it's coming together, I think the way we're feeling this car is starting to work, means it's a very strong contender. Whether it wins or not, we will have to wait and see. It wouldn't feel right 
if there wasn't a hot hatch in Evo Car of the Year. Over the years, they've carried the fight of the everyman performance car to the supercars, the super saloons and the motorsport specials. But there's no escaping that uncomfortable feeling that the sun might be setting on this type of car. Everything you touch in here is, well, absolutely out of the top drawers. So everything from obviously this Alcantara clad wheel, which feels not too thick, too thin, and just the right sort of size. Obviously, one of two manual cars in this test, the lovely metal gear shift, and I think the best manual shift in the test of the two. Then you've got these seats, which put you in the right position straight away and certainly outdo some of the supercars. It's the end of the week and the pressure is well and truly on. It's the moment of truth and time for reflection on an incredible group of cars and some very memorable driving. Yeah, I think we all probably, we try not to, but we'll arrive knowing the cars that are in the test and we'll have a sense of, oh, well, that's probably going to do pretty well and not sure about this one and interested in that one. But actually during the course of the week, I think you'll always find out something about even cars that you've known very well because you've maybe driven them a few times during the year. I think it's such a special gathering and, and because of the time of year, we always get a mixture of weather. So, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a process of massive overthinking. Um, trying to arrive at a score as well is very difficult, but... I think it has to be a reflection of your your kind of objective, how good is this as a car? And then there's more of a personal, emotional, how does it make me feel? Am I excited to drive it? Which ones have I had the most memorable moments in? And then you try and make sense of all that and put it down on a piece of paper and give it to Stuart. <laughs> week is at an end, the driving is done, the scores are in, and the results are clear. And as is so often the case with Evo Car of the Year, our contenders have formed into three definite groups. So, in ascending order, at the foot of our table, we have our two GTs, the Maserati and the Aston Martin. Now, there's so much to like about these two cars and they've really impressed us. They're a great step forward for their respective marks. They also have their obvious flaws, and that's why they're at the bottom of the leaderboard. Next, we have our middle order. Four cars that really have impressed us this year. And in a weaker year, you know, they could have been up for overall honours. There's the wonderfully exploitable and usable Carrera T. The ferociously fast and exotic M3 CS. The beautifully engineered Civic Type R and the wonderfully crazy Lamborghini Huracan Storato, a supercar that's really, for many of us, redefined what that type of car can be and the sort of fun that you can have on the road. But that brings us to our top trio, three exceptional cars. It was so, so close, but in third place is the amazing McLaren 750S. Now, McLaren has taken everything that we love about the 720S and refined it even further into a remarkable driver's machine. Could this be arguably one of the ultimate purely petrol powered supercars of our time? Congratulations McLaren on a wonderful result. But that leaves two cars separated by less than one point. In second place is a car that we all adored, that we couldn't stop driving. The wonderful Alpine A110R with its sparkling mix of ride and handling it proves that lightweight and great dynamics is more than a match for brute power. However, our winner is a force of nature, an automotive superhero brought to life. We wondered up front whether it would be far too track focused to work on the road, and yet time and time again, it provided truly memorable drives, all with a spine tingling soundtrack. Yes, it's the wing itself, our Evo car of the year for 2023 is the 911 GT3 RS. Every time we drove the GT3 RS, it astounded us. 
We already knew its abilities on track set new standards, but all of us were in awe of its capabilities on wet, wintry Scottish lanes. The ability to tune the Porsche's chassis on the fly certainly helped, but there's genuine magic at work in the way the RS appears to have very little in the way of wheel travel, yet could cope with any bump or ridge it came across. The level of grip it generated and the sheer confidence it wrought in the driver was something to behold. And then there's that powertrain, a constant presence, pure music to the ears, 